that's why I, I keep sitting here going, what are you guys talking about? Because I cannot understand what the motivation is. Why is Andy Stanley telling 32,000 people that the foundation of the faith is not the scriptures? Well, then what is it that the foundation of the faith is not the scriptures? Well, then what is it? It's what Jesus did. Well, how do you know about that? It's in the scriptures. What are you accomplishing? Christians often start as the basis of their faith with the Bible. I, <laughs> call me crazy, um, and people have, but I think that's idolatry. Well, Richard, talk me off the heretical ledge here, because I don't want to say anything false. Do you agree when I say that, technically speaking, the foundation of Christianity is not a collection of ancient writings we call the Bible? The foundation of Christianity is the reality of God and the historicity of the biblical t events, including the resurrection of Christ. Is okay. I am offended by the description of Scripture as a bunch of ancient writings, first of all. I don't know how any Christian can even use that language. I don't know how anybody who's ever read the 119th Psalm can use that kind of language. I don't, I don't, have, I, I, I don't understand it. If you really have a... Well, I don't, know, don't even know what terminology to use for it anymore. But my understanding of Scripture, my commitment to Scripture, will allow me to recognize the limited truth that scripture is a collection of ancient writings but to say that that's all it is and then to contrast it with what God has done in Jesus Christ I do not even begin to understand that mindset what I know of what God has done in Jesus Christ I know because and, and, and the reason I, I can know it with the authority and certainty of God is because God has spoken and what God has spoken is theanustos and the only thing I have that's theanustos is scripture. So to even make the distinction, see, I, I don't know what these guys are doing. Is, is this, you know, let's, let's do the least common denominator thing here. Let's so boil it down that now we don't even have to worry about defending scripture because somehow we have created this this ridiculous distinction i mean i i don't get it from whence comes this weird distinction between what scripture is historically or when it was recognized and bound together under one cover or any of the rest of this stuff and the idea that, well, the foundation is the resurrection. Okay, and I know about the resurrection. I know what the resurrection means. I know the significance of the person who was resurrected. I understand the significance of the atonement. I understand the fulfillment of, 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 of prophecy that led to all of it. On the basis of what? According to the one who rose from the dead, the first thing, the first thing that he did for his disciples was not give them Thomas Aquinas. He opened their hearts and their minds to understand the scriptures. What are you guys doing? You have people who are on websites today, someone like Peter Enns, who used to teach at an institution which required inerrancy, but no longer teaches there, uh, who says, clearly Paul did believe in inerrancy, but, but Paul was wrong. And so now you not only have the denial of inerrancy and the historicity of Genesis 1 through 3, you have Paul now in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 being said, well, now inerrancy for him means he was speaking truthfully as inspired by God, but limited to the worldview that was accessible and available to him at the time. That, that's just not, 
That is not what Jesus believed about Scripture. That is not what the church must believe about Scripture. <clears throat> Maybe I should have listened to this beforehand. Makes sense. I agree. I think it absolutely makes sense. As okay. long as our hearer realizes that what we're saying is that the foundation, and that we're not saying it, we've exhausted the, the, uh, the Christian faith by this, this foundational principle. There's more, like you said, there's more to being a sanctified Christian than you can get from the bare knowledge of these, you know, minimal events, God created the world and Jesus rose from the dead. See, this is this minimalist approach. This is this minimalist approach gone to seed. And I go back in the archives, folks. I have been warning against the corrosive effect of the minimalist approach for many, many years. There are a lot of folks don't want to have anything to do with me because I keep saying that's not enough. It's not apostolic. It's not how the apostles did it. Oh, but I've seen it work so well. Oh, so you're a pragmatist. Okay. Hmm. All right. Most Christians, when defending their faith, refer to the Bible. However, unbelievers often start by saying, I don't believe the Bible. Where do you go from there when talking to people who say this, Muslims or others? Yeah, good question. Um... Christians often start as the basis of their faith with the Bible. I, <laughs> call me crazy, um, and people have, but I think that's idolatry. I think the foundation of our faith is supposed to be Jesus. And when we point to, uh, and, and this is what has happened to people who did it backwards. They made the Bible the foundation of their faith. I'll refer to a man who was my professor um, at, when I was studying in North Carolina. Does anyone know of Duke One, by the way? Sorry. Just, woo! All right. When I was studying at Duke, um, uh, I, I got to study at UNC under a man named Bart Ehrman. Now, Bart Ehrman was raised as a Christian. He loved the Bible. He went to Moody Bible Institute in order to train under the Bible and to learn more about the Bible. And when he then went to Princeton, he learned some things that challenged his view of the Bible. And because the foundation of his faith was the Bible, it shook him to his very core, and all of a sudden he threw out everything he believed about Jesus because of the issues he had with the Bible. That happens a lot. Uh, fact of the matter is, if we come at Jesus more more. Well, I, I come at it from a historical perspective. That's just the kind of guy I am. Some people come from a theological, philosophical perspective. So forgive me for, for being kind of narrow with my blinders on. But if we come at Jesus from a historical perspective, we can conclude without first, hear me on this, without first saying the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, if we come to the Bible with a historically, even a historically critical lens, we can conclude that the best conclusions about Jesus' life are that he actually died on the cross, rose from the dead, and claimed to be God. We can even take extra biblical historical resources to come to that conclusion. Once we conclude that Jesus claimed to be God and rose from the dead, I think we now have a foundation to then say, what does Jesus teach about the Bible? What does he teach about the Old Testament? What does he teach about the New Testament? Or at least the coming New Testament? Does he say anything? Does he intimate anything? And from that basis, we can have a foundation to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, in the inspiration of Scripture. Because I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible. And not the other way around. Because if we do it the other way around, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So when you're talking with a non-Christian, yeah, they don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Come at it from a different angle. Come at it from a historical angle. That's what my friend David did with me. I'll say it another way. If before the New Testament was written, someone claimed to be a Christian because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, they were still a Christian even before they believed anything about the New Testament. So the New Testament doesn't determine whether or not you're a Christian. It's Jesus and your beliefs about Jesus that determine whether you're a Christian. The New Testament is essential to understand more, to develop your faith, to know the doctrine. It is essential, but it is built on the foundation of Jesus and what he has done for us, not the other way around. That's idolatry. Does that make sense?
It's not apostolic. It's not how the apostles did it. Oh, but I've seen it work so well. Oh, so you're a pragmatist. Okay. Hmm. All right. I think that we have done previous generations, especially of children and high school students, a terrible disservice by the way we talk about the Bible. I remember my freshman English class at Georgia State University. We were talking about literature. It was a, it was a literature class, and one of the pieces of literature was the Bible. And my teacher was not an anti-religious person, but began to talk about the myth, the creation myth, other creation myths. And without meaning to, began to slowly dismantle the faith of every single person in there who had grown up in church. When she was finished, all of us were convinced that there are many creation myths. The story of Adam and Eve is a creation myth. It's one of many. Let's move on to the next topic. Well, because of the way the scripture had been presented to me and probably everybody in that class, it's a house of cards. So as soon as you pull out one piece of the Bible to say, this is a myth, well, then immediately it's like, well, what else in there is myth? Mm -hmm. The foundation of our faith is not the scripture. The foundation of our faith is not the infallibility of the Bible. The foundation of our faith is something that happened in history. And the issue is always, who is Jesus? That's always the issue. The scripture is simply a collection of ancient documents that tells us that story. So when we talk about the scriptures, and especially the um, reliability of the scriptures, I think any time that we can tie the Old Testament especially back to Jesus, we have done everybody, Christians and non-Christians alike, an incredible service by letting them know, you know what, you can believe that the Adam and Eve story is a creation myth. So what? Who is Jesus? Mm -hmm. And then to your point, when I deal with Adam and Eve, I'm quick to say, hey, this is one of those odd stories. This is that story you heard growing up about two naked people running around in a garden. And who can believe that? And there are many creation myths. But here's why I believe this actually happened. Not because the Bible says so, but because in the Gospels, Jesus talks about Adam and Eve. And it appears to me that he believed they were actually historical figures. And if he believed they were historical, I believe they were historical. Because anybody that can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just believe anything they say. Mm -hmm. So what have I communicated? I've communicated that even though we're going to talk about Genesis and the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. the issue is, who is Jesus? Right. And I think any time that we can weave that small little apologetic into our teaching and preaching, it helps our high school students and it helps our college students understand the foundation of my faith is not an infallible Bible. It's something that happened in history. Jesus came into the world, walked on the earth, represented God, was God, and rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that's a very very important piece, or a very, very important um, part of our approach uh, to the scripture every single week. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I keep sitting here going, what are you guys talking about? Because I cannot understand what the motivation is. Why is Andy Stanley telling 32,000 people that the foundation of the faith is not the scriptures? Well, then what is it? It's what Jesus did. Well, how do you know about that? It's in the scriptures. What are you accomplishing? It's not apostolic. It's not how the apostles did it. Oh, but I've seen it work so well. Oh, so you're a pragmatist. Okay. Hmm. All right. Our scripture is 100% valid. We have a complex answer we give people. We'd love to hear if you have a simple and short answer. Our scripture is 100% valid. Well, the short answer would be yes. <laughs> um, do you have a medium length answer? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this about that. I don't argue with a non-believer about biblical inspiration and inerrancy. 
My goal as an evangelist is to set the bar as low as possible to get him into the kingdom. I want to put as few obstacles in his way in order to get him saved. And so I don't try to convince the unbeliever of biblical inerrancy or 100% reliability. Uh, I'm quite willing to say these documents could be uh, erroneous in many respects. There could be inconsistencies and contradictions, but nevertheless, they are historically reliable with respect to, for example, the four facts that I shared last night, which are sufficient for belief in the resurrection of Jesus. And if that's right, then you should become a Christian. And then the question of biblical inerrancy, scriptural reliability, that becomes an in-house question among believers. So I would really encourage you, at least in doing evangelism, don't try to set the bar so high that in order to be saved, the unbeliever has to come to believe in biblical inspiration and inerrancy. That, that's simply um, not necessary in, for, in order for him to become a Christian. I, I have a, a quick question, uh, but then I, I do want to make a comment. Mm. My question is, uh, Tim, whether you do hold to the theological view of inerrancy. Bart, you know as well as I do that that's defined in many, many different ways. I am not, a, you know, one of, I don't teach at an evangelical school. I do not uh, attend an evangelical church. I, most of my publishing is not done in evangelical uh, journals. So I'm, that's really, it's a kind of a non-issue for me. Uh, I think there are puzzles and discrepancies that I do not know how to resolve. And so I'm certainly not here to say, you know, I'm the Bible answer man, bring every question and I can answer it. Uh, on the other hand, once you've seen a lot of things that are touted as just decisive contradictions resolved, one does begin to have a suspicion that maybe something is going on here. However, from a historical point of view, I would say I couldn't maintain that. History is not even the competent instrument to maintain it. So what I'm really interested in is the historical question. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I, under, I understand that. And I'm, the reason I'm asking, I, I want to pursue it a little bit more, even though I didn't think it was going to, I thought it was going to be an easy question because I really just wanted to do yes or no. Uh, but uh, my, as you, I mean, you're a philosopher, so you know, I mean, our, our presuppositions are very important mm -hmm. for how we engage in any kind of scholarship, including historical scholarship. My personal view is that I would have uh, I would have no fewer problems with my belief in Christian doctrine if I thought the Bible was inerrant than I have if it's errant, if inerrant in the sense of, say, for example, contradictions or historical discrepancies. If there were no historical discrepancies, if there were no contradictions, that would not affect whether or not I would be a Christian or not. So so for me. It, it it ultimately doesn't matter which way that the question about the Bible goes. So, but my question for you is whether you think there are any errors in the Bible. I I do not have a position on this to sell you. I, I'm not sure what it is about what I'm saying that isn't coming across clearly. What's not coming across is know. whether you, you, you. I I don't know. I haven't found anything that I am persuaded must be, but I have found things which I do not know how to answer. And from a historical standpoint, I would say, if they're there, then take them as a historian would take them, right? If, uh, it's a wonderful line from Joseph Butler's Analogy of Religion. Uh, Let reason be kept to. And if any part of the scripture story of the redemption of man through Jesus Christ can be truly shown to be contrary to it, contrary to reason, then in the name of God, let the scripture be given up. I just have and trouble I'm believing you don't have. That. I'm having trouble believing you don't have a view about inerrancy. My view of inerrancy is that I'm weary of it. <laughs> I mean, what, what's your? What's the motivation behind this bar? Is it, is it that know. you think that if someone does hold theologically, say, to a view of inerrancy, then that must impact the way they therefore do their historical research? My view is that a person's assumptions about the Bible are going to affect how they approach the Bible. And so when I approach um, 
when I approach Josephus, uh, I don't have a theological belief that Josephus is inerrant. And as a result of that, I can look to see whether there are errors or not. If I really, at the end of the day, if because of my religious belief, uh, because of what I do on Sunday morning, or because of what I teach my children, or because of what I really think late at night, if I really thought Josephus was inerrant, no matter how much I wanted to be historical, that would guide my historical research. And so I'm simply asking what Tim's views are, and I'm, I'm finding a little I, bit frustrating. I do not approach this with any <laughs> assumption of inerrancy. If I arrive at that no, I know you. I know what you're saying, Tim. I know you're saying you don't approach Yes, I understand that you're saying you don't approach it that way, but I'm asking whether you have that view or not. I don't have a view on this that in any <laughs> sense is relevant okay. to okay. my let, 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 you, we're, we're, seem, you seem to be really excited about discussing inerrancy. <laughs> that isn't the topic that we're here for this morning. Well, I know, but I, I'm, uh, what I'm doubting is whether you, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that you can approach this without your own assumptions and presuppositions, and I'm, I'm calling that into question. But let, uh, well, let, let's, let me, let's, let's move, move on. on. Well, consider this. Evangelicals who say every word, uh, God cannot err, so every word is correct. You have people, and this would be people like Norman Geisler, they acknowledge, Geisler acknowledges in his book, what, when critics ask, that there are errors in our current text and that inerrancy applies only to the autographs. So when you take numerical discrepancies that are found in Kings, Chronicles, and Samuel, many of them, and you look at them and you look at how Geisler explains these, Geisler and Thomas Howe, they say, oh, this is obviously a scribal uh, corruption here, a scribal error. Um, okay, well, that's possible. Maybe it is a scribal error. I don't think it's obvious, but it's possibly a scribal error. Well, we don't have the manuscripts any of any good pedigree that would preserve the correct text. So what that means is, all right, you say, well, that's no problem then. We've got errors in our current Bible because Inerrancy only applies to the autographs. Well, now, wait a minute. Then that means if you were to walk up to Norman Geisler or a strict inerrantist, a rigid inerrantist, and say, look, what I want to know is, is the Bible I'm holding in my hands right now, is this an, the inerrant word of God? If they're being honest, they'd have to say no. 